So thank you everyone for coming tonight. Thank you to Sadia and the Gale Board and Public Library for having me and to all of you for being here. I'm coming to you from my office in, uh, in my home in Wicker Park. And I'm so excited that we can all be together here tonight in some format, even though uh, we're still not in person, but that we can share these secret places. Uh, I know that our travel plans are still a bit disrupted, but you know, spring is on the way. And I think it's a great time to learn more about our own backyards. So if you love Chicago, you're in the right place. And you're also in the right place if you like weird stories. I've got plenty of those to share with you. So we have a lot of secrets to give up tonight. And I like to keep things interactive. So I'll be doing just a bit of reading and trivia. And I definitely want to leave a chance at the end for you to share your favorite secret spots. And I'll also, um, if you're interested in learning more at the end, um, I'll have a discount code for anyone interested in purchasing the book. And if you, uh, as Sadia said, if you have uh, trivia responses, put them in the chat and um, any questions can go in the Q&A and we will address those at the end. So hopefully no matter how long you've lived in the area, there will be some surprises in store tonight. All right, I'm gonna start out with uh, some frequently asked questions and a little bit of background on the book. A bit about me, uh, I am not from Chicago originally, believe it or not, I grew up in Cleveland. So how did I get started? Well, I've been in Chicago for 11 years now. And when I moved here, I was so excited to be in a new place. I started looking around and asking questions about the things that I saw, the places that I would walk by or jog by. And I started um, you know, asking my friends who were from Chicago about different things I saw. And sometimes they knew, sometimes they didn't know the answer. So I would investigate things on my own and blog about it. And then I started writing for some other websites around town too. So eventually I could fill a whole book. So you could say I've been writing the book since I moved to Chicago, but the actual book process took about a year. So quick intro, this is the book. It is uh, Secret Chicago. It's got 90 places in and around the city, some photos, and just kind of like a quick summary of each place. And I wrote it for Chicagoans and visitors alike. So whether you've been here your whole life or you're just visiting for the weekend, it's kind of laid out like a scavenger hunt to more hidden side of the city. And um, so places you might not hear about, um, you know, on the travel lists. And my goal was really to get people curious to visit places that are new to them. So what did I consider secret? I defined a secret as either something hidden or a place that you might have seen before, you're familiar with, but you don't know that there's a crazy backstory to it. How did I find all these places? Well, I did a lot of reading, so shout out to our libraries. And I just asked anyone that I met. So I would be at a you know, friend's party or music festival or an art gallery and just go up to people and ask them. And I got a lot of great uh, secret ideas that way. It was important for me to feature places all across the city. So I started by taking the things that I had already written about, put them on the map. And then I looked for the holes in the map, the areas that I didn't know as much about. And I reached out to people in those communities. So I talked to historical societies, uh, neighborhood leaders, bloggers, and when all else failed, I would just go grab a drink at the bar and talk to the bartender because we know they're the true secret keepers of the neighborhood. You can imagine that it was not easy to narrow down this list of stories about Chicago. So I had a few criteria. I wanted uh, the places to be accessible for readers to visit. So there are a few where you need an appointment, but otherwise they're pretty easy to just walk in and see. I wanted there to be something there to look at. So it's not just an empty parking lot. and Again, if it is somewhere that you may have heard of, I'm hoping that I'm providing an, an interesting angle that, um, you know, or a unique story that you haven't heard before. So without further ado, let's jump into some of these secret places. If we were meeting 
in person, I would uh, hand out candy to whoever shouts out the answer to the, to the trivia questions correctly. But since we're virtual, uh, you can go ahead and place your guesses in the chat and you'll just get bragging rights. All right, so this one's kind of a tough one, but it's one of my favorites. So I'm doing this one first. Does anyone know where is Chicago's smallest cemetery? You can see that it doesn't look like your average cemetery. Someone guessed Goose Island. That's, that's actually a pretty good guess, but we are not there. We're farther south. All right, this is a tough one. This isn't a junkyard, if you can believe it. Specifically down on the south side at 93rd and Ewing. And I don't know if you can read that uh, in the photo, but the tombstone says that this person was a veteran of the Battle of Waterloo. So how did this poor guy, Andreas, end up from the Battle of Waterloo to a junkyard on the south side? Well, because this is one of my favorites, I am going to read this one. Is a soldier's grave hidden in a south side scrapyard? A scrapyard on Chicago's southeast side isn't what you would call a peaceful resting place. Between the industrial setting and resting machinery, it's the last place you'd want to spend eternity. Yet burial here was one man's last wish and it's still honored today. Andreas von Zerngibel's story started far from Chicago. He was born in Bavaria in 1797 and joined the Prussian army at age 18. He even helped defeat Napoleon at the Battle of Waterloo where he lost an arm. Afterward, Andreas started a family and began a career as a fisherman. In 1854, he moved to the small town of Chicago with his wife and five children. He bought 40 acres of land along the Calumet River for $160 in gold. He settled there and resumed the fishing trade on Lake Michigan. Just a year after arriving in Chicago, he died of a fever. According to legend, his last wish was to be buried on his homestead. His family marked the grave with a wooden cross and built a white picket fence around it. Although they moved to the north side, they continued to visit over the years. Decades later, the Calumet and Chicago Canal and Dock Company acquired the land. His relatives disputed ownership in the Illinois Supreme Court. They claimed that the property deed was lost in the Great Chicago Fire, but the company claimed that he was a squatter. The court ruled that the company owned the land, but that the grave must remain intact, and the family was granted permanent access to the grave. Industry grew up around the former homestead. Today, concrete blocks mark the grave where the cross once stood. At about 100 square feet, it may be the city's smallest cemetery, but its caretakers over the years have honored his last wish. So this scrapyard is actually closed now, uh, but you can see these concrete barriers surrounding the grave from the Ewing Avenue Bridge. Um, and when, you know, when we're not in COVID times, the Southeast Historical Society does occasionally give tours here. Um, they have those concrete barriers around the headstone because uh, it was knocked over a few times when this was a working active scrapyard uh, from all the heavy machinery moving around it. But you can see now it's, uh, now that it's closed, there's a little bit of nature growing back in here. So uh, it might one day end up looking more like it did when Andreas lived here. It's just uh, such a bizarre tale for somebody to go from battling Napoleon to, to being down here by himself in a scrapyard. And it's just one of my favorite Chicago stories. All right, I have a feeling some people will get this next one. Does anyone know what the call letters for WLS 890 stand for? What's the WLS? Um, Angel asked who is the caretaker of the grave. So the company that owns the land uh, 
even though the scrapyard is closed, they still own um, the land that it's on and they make sure that, you know, the grave is intact and they maintain it. And um, the family is allowed to visit. I, I've read an article that, you know, a few years ago, some relatives went down there. I don't think they go regularly, but um, once in a while they would like to go visit, they do have access to it. So lots of people got this one. Jerry, Ivan, Liz, Kim, Sue, Susan, Steve. World's largest store. And I think we all know that is Sears. So Sears built a headquarters in North Lawndale in 1906. And uh, part of this was the world's largest commercial building at the time. So next to this giant building was this tower, 14 story tower called the Sears Tower. And you can see um, along the top there, Sears, Sears Roebuck and Company. You know, starting in 1924, WLS began broadcasting from the 11th floor here. Now we know that Sears headquarters moved to downtown in the 70s and you know, that became the Sears Tower. So this is, I guess, the old Sears Tower, but now the Sears Tower is Willis Tower. So if that's the old Sears Tower, then I think that makes this one the old, old Sears Tower. Oh. <laughs> Uh, a little bit of architecture humor, but um, this tower is now called the Nichols Tower, and it was recently restored, so it's in great shape now, and uh, there are offices inside for many nonprofit organizations, and there's an event space, and from this photo, you can see it's taken from the top of the tower where the event space is, and there's a beautiful view of the old Sears Tower downtown from the old, old Sears Tower. Just in case you didn't know, there was more than one. All right, next up. But some people know where the world's first nuclear reaction occurred. I feel like we've got a few correct answers here. Ivan guessed Stag Field, correct, or under Stag Field. Um, Darlene, Liz, Bernadine, Chuck, Sheldon, Sharon, Steve, Jerry, Sandy, and Susan. University of Chicago. Um, Fermilab is a good guess, but it's not, it's not correct. This was at the University of Chicago in 1942 as part of the Manhattan Project. And yes, it was uh, the squash court under the football field. However, does anyone know where the reactors are located now? They did not move too far. Believe it or not, they are in the forest preserve. <laughs> so uh, they had to get, oh, D Swiss, yeah, it's, it's pretty close to Archer there. Um, it's in the Redgate Woods in uh, the Palos Preserve around Lamont. So uh, as you can imagine, being in an urban area at a university was not going to be a great long-term plan for doing nuclear research. So they, they got the reactor out of there and moved it to uh, what is now the Forest Preserve to a facility called Argonne. Now this is not the same location of Argonne that we know today, but it was out in the Cook County Forest Preserve. And after the facility was decommissioned in the 1950s, they, uh, they moved Argonne, moved to a new location where they are located now. And um, they took those old nuclear reactors and just buried them out in the woods. So there are two burial sites. One is for nuclear reactors, two of them. And the other site is for other contaminated materials, other things that, you know, got radioactive. Um, and they, you know, they covered them up, they buried them. 
they've been testing them ever since, I think in the 1970s. Um, there was a tiny bit of radioactivity, not enough to hurt anyone, but these days um, it's, it's pretty safe and, you know, nothing's going to happen to you. And they say that it is safer to leave everything buried there than to try to dig it up and move it and, you know, expose everything. So you can go hiking. The forest preserve is open. I was there a few months ago and, you know, walking around the Redgate Woods Preserve, you might come across a surprise. So you can go uh, see these two stone markers, but just like the sign says, don't dig. It's one of my favorites too, because it's just so fun to be walking through the woods and stumble on a piece of world history like that, just buried. <laughs> All right. My art fans, where can you see priceless works of art by Grant Wood, Mary Cassatt, and over a hundred Chicago area artists for free? So if you know our downtown museums, um, not free. <laughs> Someone guessed Palmer House. That's not the one that I'm thinking of, but um, I mean, it's it's an artwork in itself. I don't know if they have an art collection there. Not Loyola. Uh, they, I know that Loyola does have an art museum. So this is actually in a Chicago Park District Fieldhouse. It's the Ridge Park Fieldhouse in Beverly, and it's called the Vanderpool Art Collection. So John Vanderpool was uh, an artist and an art educator who lived in the Beverly neighborhood. He was a professor at the School of the Art Institute, and he taught Georgia O'Keeffe, and he was a judge in painting and art for the 1893 World's Fair. He passed away in 1911, and when he died, his friends and admirers began donating works of art in his name. So this entire collection is donated, which is pretty incredible. So it's got about 200 pieces on view here in the park district, and they've got even more in storage. They don't even have enough room to hang everything up. But downstairs, you know, if it's normal times, you've got kids playing basketball and going to summer camp, and you just go up one flight of stairs and there's this priceless, beautiful art collection um, and just like a quiet room and not, not too many people in there. So it's, it's free to visit and it's a, it's a quiet, beautiful space that um, is kind of a hidden gem. I don't believe that they are open right now due to COVID, but something to put on the list when things open back up. All right. If anyone has ever told you to run away and join the circus, you can do that in Chicago. There is a circus in Logan Square hidden inside what kind of building? Looks like Ivan and Rebecca were first here. This is a church. So it's called a loft circus arts and they offer classes in things like trapeze, trampoline, aerial silks, and it's all located inside a former church built in 1908 and it's been converted into a different kind of big top because you can see those tall church ceilings are perfect for hanging all the tall rigging that you need for uh, you know, doing these kinds of activities. Even the bell tower has been converted into a training space. So you can take a two-year program there, be a full-time student and become a circus professional. Or they also have, uh, you know, just people who do it as a hobby or for exercise. You can take a $10 taster class to just get an idea of the different disciplines that they have there. Um, they also right now have virtual classes. So if you're looking to pick up a new skill, they're not all so athletic. I don't, I don't think I will be doing um, trapeze anytime soon, but some of their virtual classes are like clowning, um, stretching, handstands, 
think they've got some magic on there. So um, some some different things that you can try and, and come out of COVID and pandemic with a new skill that you can impress your friends with later. So I would check out Aloft Circus Arts. Um, the church, I don't know the name of it. Somebody asked, it was uh, an evangelical church and it was built in 1908. Um, and the business is called Aloft Circus Arts. All right, we're going to head to the loop. Uh, improv legend Del Close died in, I think, 1999, and he bequeathed a very personal item to the Goodman Theater. Does anyone know what it was? Got some comedy fans, Steve, D Swiss, Pamela, and, and Steve, and Ray. Oh, we lots of Ramona, Darlene, Angel, his skull. <laughs> so if you don't know Del Close, he's a comedy legend and he mentored the likes of Bill Murray and John Belushi. When he died, he left his skull to the theater in his will. He wanted it to be used as a production, as a, as a prop in a production of Hamlet or some other plays that they were doing there. So it's in the office now of the artistic director. He's got it in a lucite case on a red velvet pillow and that's where his skull is. But there's a twist. A few years after that, his business partner admitted that this was not really Del Close's skull. Even though it was in his will, that that's what he wanted to be done with his skull. Uh, the hospital did not let her just take it. So she just went down to a medical supply store and bought a different skull. And she even removed a few of the teeth to make it match the ones that he was missing. So uh, although he didn't get his last wish, I think he did get the last laugh because somebody's skull's in his office. <laughs> and you know, if you're enjoying the presentation and you'd like to leave any body parts, um, I'm happy to take cash instead. All right. Going back to the circus. Showman's Rest is a burial plot for circus performers, and they have statues of what kind of animal guarding their graves? Like G Swiss, Ramona, Rebecca, Marge, Liz, Brian, Eileen Marie, and Steve got elephants. Have you guys all been here before? Seems like a lot of you know this one. Uh, this is in Woodlawn Cemetery, and the plot is called Showman's Rest. It is a burial place for circus and outdoor performers. And it was purchased by the Showman's League in 1917. Now the Showman's League is, was founded in Chicago and it is still headquartered here today. Buffalo Bill was their first president. Uh, just a year after they purchased this plot, unfortunately, they had to put it to use. There was a, a circus train accident in Hammond, Indiana and 56 people were buried here as a result. Now this was the early 1900s and they didn't have everyone's, you know, records up to date um, for their employer. And uh, there were day laborers. They didn't even know everybody's legal names. So some of the uh, unfortunate victims were buried with their show name or their nickname like Baldy or just unknown male and female. But they have five elephant sculptures to watch over them and their trunks are lowered in a sign of mourning. Uh, this is at Woodlawn Cemetery. You can visit the cemetery now, it is open, if you would like some fresh air. I do, I do recommend cemeteries as a good place to go on a socially distant walk because uh, there's lots of beautiful landscaping and nature and they're usually not very crowded, so easy to social distance. If you visit, you might hear some ghostly animal noises in the cemetery, legend has it. Uh, however, there's no elephants actually buried here, they're just sculptures. So we're guessing this is probably just coming from the Brookfield Zoo. I have been to an actual elephant graveyard, but that's a story for another day. 
All right, so in Chicago, we have a lot of speakeasy themed places, but where can you watch a show in authentic Chicago speakeasy? The Green Mill was not the one that I'm thinking of here, but that I do, I do talk about uh, the Green Mill's colorful history in the book. That was one that I wasn't sure if it was secret enough, but I pulled a lot of people and they didn't know about uh, some of the, the crazier stories of the Green Mill, so I did include some. Tommy Guns, I haven't been to, I don't know, was that an operating speakeasy in Prohibition or is that are they doing like a, a modern version? We'll have to go check it out. So this is actually the Drifter. Uh, this is located inside the Green Door Tavern. And the Green Door's name refers to the practice during prohibition of painting your door green to indicate that there's a speakeasy inside because you paid the green to operate. So the entrance to the drifter is hidden, but because you're here, I will fill you in on the secrets. You enter the Green Door Tavern, you go all the way to the back and you head downstairs. And if you don't see the door, it's because it's hidden behind the tchotchke cabinet. Now, all the decorations and the bottles that you see in this photo on the walls are, uh, were found in the space. So it was used as a speakeasy during prohibition and then they just use it for storage for you know, several decades after that. When they were cleaning the space out, they found all this cool old stuff and used it as decorations. They also moved a water heater and when they uh, took down the drywall, they found the trap door that they used to transport the barrels in from the alley down here into the speakeasy. So that's pretty cool to see. So now it is called the Drifter, it is a cocktail bar. They print their cocktails on tarot cards and about once an hour they have sideshow acts. Uh, they do things like sword swallowing and hula hoop burlesque, which was uh, the previous picture, uh, magic. And it's a very fun space to put on your list um, for when you know, it's safe to go back into bars because uh, there's nothing like having a cocktail in a space that was actually a speakeasy during Prohibition and getting a show. All right. In the 1890s, 60% of Chicago's streets were paved with what material? There's still a few alleyways in the city where you can see this today. Sheldon, Kim, Annette, Ivan, Ramona, Pamela, Steve, Trisha, Rebecca, Jerry, Liz, Marge. <laughs> you guys are good. This is wood block. So they installed wood on the streets because at this time they thought that it would be cleaner and quieter than stones. This is when you've got horses, uh, you know, walking up and down the road, making noise. And at that time, there was a steady cheap supply of lumber coming in from Michigan and Wisconsin. So it was pretty affordable, more affordable than stone. And believe it or not, it actually held up pretty well against the Great Chicago Fire. As I said, there are a few places where you can still see these alleyways. There's a couple in Lakeview and they're, they're kind of crumbling, falling apart. Um, you know, they're not in great condition. They're very, very old. But there's this one you can see in this photo is looking pretty good. And the reason is because the Gold Coast Neighborhood Association restored it in 2011 for $400,000. Um, so there's only one company in the country left, the other in Massachusetts, who still creates these woodblock pavers and they found them and they used a black locust here to repave this alley and make it look great. And very thankful to them because now we can walk in the footsteps of history. All right, I mentioned I did not grow up 
in Chicago. And when I was doing my research for the book, this is one of the most astounding statistics um, that I learned. Chicago is home to the largest mass grave in the Western Hemisphere. Does anyone know where that is? Jim guessed Bohemian. That's not the one, but uh, that is where the victims of the Eastland disaster are, which I think was like the biggest nautical um, tragedy. It's not Douglas Park. Uh, they are from Camp Dearborn. So Liz got half that and Ivan said Oakwood, which is correct. So this is Oakwood's cemetery. And, oh, Rebecca got it too. This was surprising to me because we know that there were no Civil War battles fought in Illinois, but Chicago was home to a Confederate prison of war camp. It was called Camp Douglas, which um, is maybe where someone got Douglas earlier because it was named after Senator Stephen Douglas who donated his land for the camp. And it started out as a Union soldier training camp. And this was um, where Bronzeville is today. Uh, but as the war dragged on and prison camps got, got overcrowded, they needed more places to house prisoners of war. So they began uh, keeping Confederates there. And it was quickly overcrowded. They had about twice as many people uh, there as it was built for. The conditions were swampy. Um, a lot of people died. It was called 80 Acres of Hell was the nickname. So not a great place. It was um, the most deadly Union camp of the war, unfortunately. So uh, 4,000 people who died here are now buried in this mass grave and all of their names are etched on the sides that you can see here. Now, right nearby are uh, the graves of some Union soldiers who were guards at the camp. So you've got some Confederates and Union soldiers buried next to each other and um, in a cemetery with a lot of very iconic African-Americans. So it's a very uh, interesting history here happening. Um, the cemetery is open. I was there a few months ago and while you're there, you can check out some very notable people, Jesse Owens, Mayor Harold Washington, and Enrico Fermi, who worked on that nuclear reactor we talked about. Um, somebody asked why I'm presenting myself as taking the photos. Well, I did take every single photo that's in the book. So, um, you know, maybe somebody else took the same photo of the same sign, but these are all by me. All right. In what neighborhood do artists credit an underground energy vortex for helping them get creative? Any guesses? Old Town is a good guess. Definitely has an artsy legacy. Not Wrigleyville. It is Bolton Market. And um, because many of us are not familiar with war to seize, I'm going to read this one too. Before it was home to Chicago's trendiest restaurants, Fulton Market earned a reputation as an enclave for warehouse parties and creative types. Those in the know attribute the abundance of creative talent to something more than natural skills, a vortex. What is a vortex? According to Mars Gallery, it's a center of creative energy that many people feel vibrate through their bodies and minds. People and animals are drawn to vortices where energy exists on multiple dimensions and interacts with one's inner self. Vortex locations are usually reserved 
for Earth's mystical natural sites like Sedona. They're rarely found in urban settings. However, Mars Gallery is reportedly located over one of these energy vortex circles. This forest lends vibrational energy to the gallery and the surrounding area. When I'm all by myself, I can almost feel a low frequency, says artist and gallery owner Peter Mars. Whatever is going on seems to stimulate creativity. A lot of the artists have commented on it. But don't take Peter's word for it. In 2002, the Chicago Journal hired a shaman to inspect the vortex. Parapsychologist Nabil Musa examined the gallery with a walking stick, tapping the floor and the walls. His findings confirmed an energy vortex near the back of the gallery. If you're interested in tapping into this well of creative energy, head to the alley near Mars Gallery's rear loading docks. You'll know you've reached the epicenter when you see spray paint on the street and a collection of tokens that artists and other visitors leave to thank the vortex. Whether or not you feel a rush of creativity after visiting the vortex, you're bound to get inspired by the many galleries and creative spaces nearby. So when I went to interview Peter Mars for this book, um, he asked me if I could feel the vortex because we were sitting in his studio right near the epicenter of it. And I said, you know, I feel very relaxed and very happy, but I didn't know if, you know, it's the vortex or because I just had a big lunch. So you'll have to go down to Fulton Market and uh, walk around the alley and see if you can feel anything. Now, Mars Gallery has relocated as of a few months ago. The building was purchased and I really want to talk to the new owners and find out if they know about this vortex that is on, uh, on, the, on the grounds of the building that they purchased or uh, if they do, does a vortex cost extra in your in your lease? I am dying to know. Okay, uh, I've got a water here, but if you've got a beer, time to raise a glass. What Chicago brewery is powered by food waste? Goose Island is a good guess, but not the one. Ivan's got it, it is Weiner Beer. So Weiner Beer is located inside of a building called The Plant in the back of the Yards neighborhood. And it's a former pork, pork, pork processing plant called Pure Foods. So you can see the pier here on the outside and then it was on top and they very cleverly just turned that around to show what is there now. Um, but now these days, the plant is a vertical farm and sustainable business incubator. So there are about 16 or 20 businesses inside at any given time, and they focus on sustainable food production and energy consumption. And they all kind of help each other out. So for example, the uh, burlap bags from the coffee company are then used to grow microgreens, or the spent yeast and wheat from the brewery are used in the bakery. And the entire facility is working on becoming powered by an anaerobic digester. So they'll be able to use their organic waste and put it in this big machine. And other organizations around the city, like I believe Shed Aquarium is one, have pledged to donate their organic waste also, because um, I guess it will take a lot to power this big facility. Um, and once they're able to power themselves with organic waste, then they'll be completely off the grid and you know, it'll be a closed loop sustainable uh, system here, which is really neat. Uh, during normal time, they do offer tours. I recommend checking it out sometime. It's very neat to see how they've used this, this building that was used for food production and have flipped it to be uh, more sustainable today. Now they do have a weekly farmer's market and it's continuing online now so you can order uh, food, vegetables, and other products from the businesses inside, like finer beer. There's kombucha, coffee, bakery. Um, you can pick them up there or have things delivered. And I am enrolled in their CSA, so they partner with other local farms, and I get a, a box of local produce from them um, weekly. So that's been really fun to explore and uh, find a way to get some really, really local stuff. 
Yes, Ivan mentioned uh, the Packing Town, Packing Town Museum uh, dedicated to the history of, you know, the packaging in the back of the yards. Have you been there, Ivan? I have not been there yet. I don't know if it has opened yet. I believe they're talking about last year. I'm looking forward to that. I love a small museum. Speaking of museums, <laughs> Museum of Surgical Science has a lot of interesting things, but uh, among them is the death mask of an infamous ruler. Does anyone know who that might be? If you need a hint, we've mentioned this person today already. Ivan says that he saw a talk for the Packingtown Museum. Okay, so it sounds like it's there, but haven't been there yet. Sharon got it. The answer is Napoleon. So you might imagine that the Museum of Surgical Science has a lot of creepy things that make you appreciate modern healthcare, but I was surprised that they have a fine arts collection, which is what this uh, plaster cast belongs to. And it was made from Napoleon's death mask in 1821. They have uh, manuscripts and a library, including Florence Nightingale's letters and beautiful paintings and sculptures that illustrate medicine throughout history. We've got a hall of uh, beautiful sculptures of scientists and um, you know medical people, uh, inventors. And of course they do have a lot of crazy things like an iron lung and this set of uh, ancient trephine skulls, which is when they would drill a hole in your skull to relieve pressure. So glad we can just take an anvil today. Uh, but this whole collection is all located inside a mansion and it's the only mansion in the Gold Coast that is open to the public. So it's right down the street from that woodblock alley that we talked about if you want to do a little neighborhood trip. Uh, this mansion was built to resemble Versailles and it belonged to a socialite. She uh, left it to a museum when she passed away. So you're walking around looking at uh, the Iron Lung and they have a modern art collection. Uh, they've got an old timey apothecary, but it's all inside this museum with like marble uh, staircases and chandeliers. So it's this gorgeous setting, a very unique place to visit. All right. The Rolling Stones wrote a song called 2120 South Michigan. I don't know if anyone knows this one. It's kind of a deep cut. But what is at that address now? I'm going to try to play part of the song for you. Hopefully this will work. If it doesn't work, then I'm just dancing. Looks like I've inspired you guys. <laughs> it is a blues museum. And Rebecca uh, spared you from my dancing. This is uh, Willie Dixon's Blues Heaven Foundation. Now, in the 1950s and 60s, as a D Swiss guest, it was home to the legendary rhythm and blues label Chess Records. They produced hits like Johnny Be Good and Etta James's At Last. And blues legend Willie Dixon worked there as a musician for many years. He created this foundation to preserve the blues music legacy and get some royalties for the artists. So you can tour this building and learn about Chicago's blues history. You can see the studio that Keith Richards called the perfect sound studio. Now, when I visited, there were people there from all over the world. There was someone from the Netherlands and um, Hungary and the UK. I was the only person from Chicago who was on the tour. So um, I know they're talking about putting in another blues museum in the loop, which is great, but I think there's something really special about being able to go and see the place where the songs were recorded and where these artists worked. So um, 
look out this summer to see if they're open and they normally do free concert once a week in the summer. There's a garden that's attached to the museum. So if you'd like to go get a sample of that, um, you know, check out their website and see if, if they've got that going on this year. All right, sports fans. Bohemia National Cemetery is the final resting place for which sports fans? Darlene got it first, Ivan and Ramona. This is the Cubs, you can see that there. So hopefully we get um, a little more baseball this year. This is located five miles north of Wrigleyville and the plot is called Beyond the Vines. It was built specifically for Cubs fans and it was built by a Cubs fan, for Cubs fans. He wanted to make the experience of visiting your loved ones in the cemetery to be, I don't want to say fun, but you know, maybe a little more memorable. And they've got a columbarium, which is a fancy word for a burial wall, with space for 288 urns. And they also have graves, if you prefer that, in the plot. And there is a, a bench and stadium seats and ivy and turf and a home plate, all from Wrigley Field. So you can see that people leave ticket stubs and baseball cards and other mementos for their loved ones. Um, so if Wrigley Field is your home in life, this could be a good place for your afterlife. I, I don't want to say that it's fun, but it is, I think, a little more upbeat than, um, you know, a normal cemetery plot. You can remember all the good times you had together playing baseball, watching baseball. All right, does anyone recognize this image. It's in a historic room that a preservationist unfortunately died trying to preserve. Jerry got that one right away and Angel, Patricia. So this is at the Art Institute and I know that the Art Institute is not a secret place. It is a very well-known place. But I think that within the Art Institute, this is kind of a hidden spot. And let me know if you disagree, but I am an Art Institute member and it took me, I think, years until I uncovered this, this room. It's the Chicago Stock Exchange Trading Room. And I think the reason why it feels so hidden is that it's in kind of a corner of the museum. You have to walk down a stair to get to the door and the doors are closed, but they're not locked. Like anyone can go in there, but it just kind of seems less noticeable than some of the other areas. And, oh, okay, I'm glad Angel agrees. It's way in the back. So um, it's just a little less obvious than some of the other big attractions at the Art Institute. Now the Chicago Stock Exchange Trading Room, uh, or the Chicago Stock Exchange was built in 1894 by the famous architecture duo of Louis Sullivan and Dankmar Adler. And it was unfortunately slated for demolition in the 70s when Chicago was losing a lot of historic buildings. So many people were working to, to save these buildings and Richard Nickel was a photographer who was helping um, take photos to document and uh, salvaging pieces of architectural treasures all around the city. So he was here uh, in this room for months documenting it until he tragically died in a, an accident at the site. So he never lived to see the room reconstructed, but the Art Institute did renovate and reconstruct the trading room um, or restored all the beautiful details that you can now see and enjoy. Um, the craftsmanship is just incredible, looking at all the colors and the stenciling and the stained glass and the wood carving. It's really beautiful. They, they truly don't make them like this anymore. And I really appreciate that it's such a quiet space in the middle of bustling Art Institute, steps away from Michigan Avenue and you walk in there, there's usually no one else in there or maybe one other person is in that room. So, you know, when I'm in the Art Institute, I need a breather. I like to go in there and just have some quiet and just appreciate the space and um, thankful to people like Richard Nickel and other preservationists who have preserved for us. 
All right, I would love to see uh, some guesses for this one. How many terminals are there at O'Hare? I haven't been to O'Hare in a year now. <laughs> Probably not going to anytime soon, but see if you guys remember. I see five, four, lots of five, lots of four, three, Hmm, I'm not sure. I'm not sure which what one looks pretty evenly divided. Well, thank you for weighing in. Four domestic, one international. Five, one is closed. All right. Drum roll, please. <laughs> the answer is four. Now, when you look at the sign, you may never have noticed because you're probably in a rush to get on a plane, but they, they are numbered one, two, three, and five. So there is no terminal four. It used to exist, but when they built the new international terminal in the late eighties, they closed terminal four and they named the new terminal five because they thought that it was less confusing for travelers than naming the new one four and having people go over here where the old one used to be instead of the new one. I don't know if that's less confusing, but that was their goal. Um, so we don't have a number four. There is a sign of where four used to be. And uh, if you're a nerd like me, I like to go and, and look for it when I'm in O'Hare and get a kind of a chuckle to myself. But when you, when you walk in, you see this big sign, you take a left. And before you get on the moving walkway, you look to your left again. And there's a sign for elevator center four. Now that just goes up to a bus terminal. Nothing too special, but that's where terminal four used to be. So I like to look out for it and, and uh, remember Terminal 4. <laughs> I know that there's some new construction happening at O'Hare. Does anybody know, is there going to be a new terminal? If so, what are they gonna number it? Are they gonna call it four? Are they gonna call it nine, just something random? <laughs> Six, who knows? If you know, let me, let me know. <laughs> All right, this is kind of a spooky one. Uh, there's a Chicagoland cemetery that has a woman whose body was exhumed after her mother had nightmares that she was buried alive. Anyone know this story? It's not Graceland. That's a great guess, though. They've got a lot of great stories. D-Swiss got it. It is Mount Carmel. I feel like this is a hard one. So this woman's name is Julia Bucola. She died in 1920 in childbirth. And she's a nickname the Italian bride because she was buried in her wedding gown. Um, now, just a few months after she died, her mother Philomena started having nightmares that her daughter was buried alive. She wanted to exhume the body. And everyone said, so sorry for your loss. Um, just trying to get some rest. We're not going to exhume the body. And, you know, a few months went by, a few years went by, and she kept having nightmares. And she, she came again and said, let's exhume the body. I think something's wrong. And everyone said, we're not going to do that. It's been a while now, and that's probably not a good idea. Um, you know, let your daughter rest peacefully. But can you imagine what it's like to have nightmares for seven years? So she finally, after all that time and all that pestering, got everyone to exhume the body. And when she did, the results shocked everyone because although the coffin was showing signs of decomposition after seven years in the ground, Julia's body appeared to be perfectly preserved. So they took this, the community took this as a sign from God and they built this beautiful marble sculpture at her grave. And there are two photos on the sculpture. The top photo is Julia in her wedding gown. So that's what inspired uh, the sculpture here. And the bottom photo is Julia on the day that she was exhumed. So this is, this is my photo of the photo on the um, sculpture here. And so, I mean, she looks pretty good, but you can go to the cemetery, go to Mount Carmel and see for yourself. Now there's a high school across the street and students from the high school have reported seeing a woman in white walk through the cemetery at night. So perhaps she never did go back underground. I don't know, was anyone, did anyone go to school over there? Has anyone heard this legend? Her hand doesn't look good. Oh, 
That's true. Yeah, I think they were focusing on how great her skin looked. Um, but yeah, it's right there on the monument. All right, last one for you. Where's the world's tallest church? It is in the loop. Angel's got that. It is a Methodist church. All right, a few of you guys are guessing it. It is a Sky Chapel. It is in the loop. It is a Methodist church. It is the first United Methodist Church. Um, you might be able to recognize it now from the outside here next to Daly Plaza. This congregation is older than the city of Chicago. They were founded in 1831 and their first church was a log cabin across the river, but they upgraded and in 1924, they built this Gothic skyscraper. Now to get to uh, the Sky Chapel, it's all the way in the old bell tower up on the 27th floor. You have to take two elevators and a set of stairs, narrow stairs to get all the way up there. And um, in the Sky Chapel, yes, you see the stained glass. Two things here, it's the chapel itself is in the stained glass, which I don't think you see it very often. And somebody mentioned that an airplane, because you know usually stained glass in these old churches predates airplanes, but not in this case, which is pretty cool. Now, this chapel is 568 feet tall, and it is the highest place of worship above street level. Now, there is the, the main church for uh, First United Methodist is on the ground floor, and in between all those floors, they have some offices, um, but they do rent out a good portion of the building because it's prime location down here downtown. Um, a lot of attorneys rent offices there because they've got, you know, right next to um, City Hall and the courts and you know, you're right in the heart of the loop here. So it makes sense that the church would make some money and rent out a lot of this real estate. But there's a building in Germany called Ulm Minster. It's only 530 feet tall, but they like to claim that they are the tallest building used entirely for religious purposes because ours is not entirely religious. So we are the highest place of worship above street level. Either way, it's a great view from up there. And during normal time, the church does give a free tour daily. Um, anyone can come in and take a tour and get to go see the Sky Chapel, which I think is really nice that they invite people to come in and share this very unique space with them. I know we are right at time. Oh, Patricia's got a friend who used to work there. Oh gosh, I bet that's a really cool building to work in. Free location. All right, so I don't. I know we're right at time. Um, I would love to hear if you have any favorite secret places around Chicagoland because, as I mentioned, I learned so much just by asking other people what their favorite secret spots were, and you guys are you know, super knowledgeable. Um, so please share. And if you have any questions, please post there to those in the chat too. If you'd like to check out the book, you can find it at Barnes and Noble, Amazon, your local bookstore, or you can order it for me directly at secretchicagobook.com. I've got a discount for, a, you know, a thank you for attending today. And you can also follow me on social media, sign up for an early newsletter, all on the website. Does anyone have any questions?